Okay, great. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about uh, some potentially induced earthquakes that started this summer in Greeley, Colorado. And as scientists, our interactions with uh, regulators, with industry, and with media, what that's been like. Uh, right off the bat, I'd like to thank Iris Pascal for providing us with instrumentation. As well, I'd like to thank the USGS for providing us with funding. Uh, just, so just to give you some context, uh, this is a seismicity map of Colorado. Uh, the red dots are earthquakes. And these are all the earthquakes um, in the ANSS catalog uh, up through May 30th, 2014, uh, this summer. And you can see that basically east of the mountains uh, in the Denver Basin, there's very little seismicity. It's a very aseismic area. Um, most of the seismicity is west in the mountains. And you can see some specific clusters, which are actually cases where uh, earthquakes have been linked to wastewater injection. Uh, so Raton Basin in the south, RT, PV, Paradox Valley, Rangeley, RN, and then Rocky Mountain Arsenal, uh, which actually was in the Denver Basin. Uh, so on June 1st, UTC, so that was May 31st local time, there's a magnitude 3.2 in Greeley, Colorado. Um, and it came as a surprise, just because we haven't seen earthquakes in this region. Um, the closest seismic station was that Green Triangle, uh, is over 100 kilometers away, so the precise location uh, of this earthquake was poorly known. So we knew that if we wanted to study it, we'd have to put seismic stations closer to the earthquake. Um, and the earthquake was widely felt in Colorado. I mean, a magnitude 3.2 doesn't sound very large, but it was noticeable. There was, uh, this is a Did You Feel It report from the USGS, and there were reports as far south as uh, Lakewood in Golden, Colorado. Uh, and we were interested in this earthquake as well because we thought it had the potential to be, it had the potential to be induced. Uh, Greeley is an area of active oil and gas development. Um, there's a lot going on. And if we looked at the earthquake location, so that's the star, and compared it to wastewater injection wells in the area, we could see that it was fairly close to an active well. Uh, in this plot, the circles are scaled by the volume of water that was injected by the well in the previous year. Uh, the NGL C4A well had um, been injecting at higher volumes than most of the other wells in the area. And it was also a unique well because in injecting at a larger depth than most of the other wells, it's injecting near the sediment basement contact. Uh, so because of this, we were initially suspicious of this well. And the connection between uh, wastewater injection and um, this earthquake was made pretty quickly by the media. Uh, so the earthquake was on Saturday. Here, a couple days afterwards, uh, there's an article that says, the Greeley earthquake possibly natural, scientists say. And on June 3rd, there's another article saying, was the Greeley quake a frack quake? And I think what's interesting about this is both of these uh, articles interviewed Justin Rubenstein uh, to get information about this earthquake. And you can see that they took a different approach in their headlines. Uh, so this is just a brief outline of how our seismic deployment went. Uh, the earthquake was on Saturday, May 31st. Uh, we requested instruments the next day. Uh, once we found out that we were getting instruments, we were able to start siting stations. So we went out and spoke with the public in the area to see if we could put seismic stations on their property. Uh, the following day, once we received a station in the afternoon, we were able to get one out. And the following week, we were able to get out the rest of our seismic stations. And getting out quickly and talking to the public was really important to us. We gathered a lot of useful information. Uh, for one, we, could, uh, we had the idea that this earthquake might have been shallow. A lot of people described uh, hearing the earthquake. People described the earthquake as possibly sounding like a truck hit their house or thinking that a gas well had exploded. Um, but we weren't exactly sure where the epicenter of the earthquake was. So we started with a deployment uh, in a pretty wide area around where we thought the epicenter was. And once we started, uh, monitoring seismicity, we were able to put more stations in closer to these aftershocks. And while we were doing this, the media was really interested in the work we were doing. Uh, we had a lot of different local news stations come out with us. We had radio stations come out and interview us while we were doing work. And it was pretty difficult to uh, be able to do work and uh, so like deploy quickly these seismic stations and interview with the media at the same time. Uh, it was very a large time sink, but I think it was very useful because it got the word out to the public on what was going on, why we were interested in this earthquake. And one of the things we tried to drive home when talking to the media was the fact that we were out there collecting more data. We didn't know whether or not these earthquakes were induced. Uh, we couldn't make a decision one way or the other. We just were out there collecting more data. On the left, you can see me in my typical field gear. Uh, <laughs> working on a seismic station. Um, so we had our first meeting with regulators. We met with the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission, a COGCC, on June 11th. And they were really interested in what we were doing, why we were doing it, and what we were seeing. 
I mean, from a regulator perspective, they want to know, are these earthquakes induced or not? And again, we were driving home the point that we are just out there collecting more data. But we could tell them that we were very suspicious of these earthquakes. Uh, so this is one of the figures that we were able to provide early on that kind of exemplified why we were, uh, why we're suspicious. So the purple line is the monthly reported cumulative injected volume at the C4A well, so the well we were suspicious of. And then the dots are earthquakes. Uh, we were able to locate some or detect some smaller earthquakes using something called template matching. Uh, we used the 3.2 earthquake as a template and cross correlated it back in time and able to find some smaller earthquakes. The earliest one we could find is in November of 2013. And we can see that this is after that purple line shoots up, so after injection volume started at a higher rate. Uh, so these are the kind of figures that we could show early on. Uh, so this is just a map of our early aftershocks uh, pretty soon after our deployment, and we were able to provide this with the, to the regulators. But it was pretty difficult to explain to them the uncertainty in this. And one of the issues we had early on was being able to find the right velocity model for the area. Um, Depending on the velocity model we chose, the locations of the earthquakes could move, and they were very interested in the depths of these earthquakes. Um, so depending on the velocity model, our earthquakes could appear very shallow or they could be deeper. But there were some certain things we could tell them. Uh, we could tell them that these earthquakes are shallower than five kilometers, for example. Uh, but conveying the uncertainty was a bit difficult. Um, so on June 22nd, they started to see an increase in the number of small earthquakes. Uh, there's a magnitude 2.6 on June 23rd. On June 21st, for, uh, sorry, 24th, we met with the uh, NGL, which was the wastewater company operating the well. And it was a lunch meeting, and it was very friendly. And uh, we were interested in seeing what sort of data we could collect from them and just letting them know the work we were doing and why we were suspicious of the well. Uh, we found out on the drive home that the COGCC actually requested the well be shut down. It was shut down for a period of 20 days. And I think once the well was regulated, that's when our uh, relationship with industry started to change. Uh, we ended up meeting with the Colorado Oil Gas Conservation Commission and with NGL and with Noble Energy uh, on June 28th. And the dynamic of the meeting was very different. It seemed a bit hostile. Um, it felt like people were questioning our credibility and our motives. Um, and I think one of the things that really hampered our relationship was uh, the media ended up showing up at this meeting. And I think that made industry feel like we were trying to garner attention for ourselves. Um, but that wasn't on purpose. Um, so, you know, NGL uh, refuted that they were inducing these earthquakes, but they did take mitigating steps to remove themselves from the hypothesis that they were inducing earthquakes. Uh, they cemented the bottom of the well, and then the COGCC allowed them to start injecting at lower rates. Uh, they've convinced, uh, eventually we were provided with a velocity model based off of sonic logs. Um, so we were able to get more accurate aftershock locations. Uh, injection, again, was increased. Um, and then we were seen, shown some 3D seismic in the area uh, looking for faults. Injection increased again. Um, and uh, so now we have a more robust data set. And we have a poster that we, uh, that's on Friday if you're more interested in the science behind it. But there are some lessons that we've learned from uh, these interactions. Uh, one, with regulators, it's definitely worth spending time. Uh, they're the ones who can help you gather data. Uh, they're also the ones uh, who can enact change. So if you share with them and you're honest about what you know and what you don't know, um, they're really the ones who are going to make changes. Something we learned is that our communications are open records. We weren't aware of this before, uh, but in emailing with them, all those emails are publicly available. So that's something to keep in mind. Uh, with media, they get the message out, but they also want to tell a story. Um, you know, I've, at one time, I was videotaped by four news agencies at the same time, and they all took a very different spin on it. Um, it's a substantial time sink, but the more time you put into it, the better they'll be able to report. But it can also hamper your relationships with industry. Uh, from an industry perspective, the micro community is interested in this, uh, and they want to help out because they see this as a business opportunity. But our conclusions can affect the operations of the wastewater wells, and because of that, it affects their business. So uh, clearly, communication between them can be a bit difficult. And then also, we've had non-disclosure agreements offered to us multiple times for data. And as scientists, we feel that we want to be as open as possible, so we can't work with, under these agreements. Um, science, you know, starting monitoring seismicity early is helpful to everyone. Um, so we have a poster uh, detailing the science on Friday. If you can come check it out, that'd be great. 
Uh, we're still trying to acquire more information. Uh, a traffic light system is in place at the well, so if there's an earthquake over a certain magnitude, they'll put the uh, well on a yellow light and uh, change injection operations, and then if there's a larger magnitude, they'll stop injection. Uh, and then there's also another well that's uh, coming into place. It, I don't know if it started injecting or not, but it's already been permitted, and it's in an area where we're already seeing earthquakes. So it'll be interesting to see how that develops. So thank you.